Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program this afternoon, Altruism and Adaptation, American Jewish Life in the Interwar Period with Dr. Miriam Eve Mora. My name is Rachel King. I'm the Executive Director of the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at New England Historic Genealogical Society, and I will be your moderator today. The Jewish Heritage Center collects, preserves, and illuminates the Jewish history of New England and beyond to connect people with Jewish heritage and to educate a wide audience about Jewish contributions to our world. We are located in Boston at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, America's founding genealogical organization. Today we'll be learning about a vital period in the early 20th century when strict immig immigration quotas and other events greatly impacted and began to transform the American Jewish community. But before we get started, I do just wanna make a few housekeeping notes about this webinar. You in the audience will be muted throughout the presentation. Uh, if you have questions while Dr. Mora is speaking, you can type them into the Q&A uh, uh, panel at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get to as many questions as we can following the presentation. Also, as we are broadcasting from different locations, we ask you to bear with us if we uh, experience any technological issues. And even if there are hiccups on your end or on ours, uh, we, you will receive a link to this, um, to a full recording of this session afterward that, so you can watch it and share it later. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker today. Dr. Miriam Eve Mora is the inaugural historian in residence at the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center a position generously funded by Richard Schilder. Miriam is also the Director of Academic and Public Programs at the Center for Jewish History in New York City. Miriam holds her doctorate in Immigration and Ethnic History, specializing in Jewish American acculturation, ethnicity, and gender. She has published several articles and anthology chapters on the topics of American Jewish identity, Jews and Science Fiction, and Masculinity in American Culture. Her forthcoming book, Carrying a Big Shtick, American Jewish Acculturation and Masculinity in the 20th Century, has just won the Jordan Schnitzer First Publication Award from the Association for Jewish Studies, and will be released by Wayne State University Press next winter. As our historian in residence, Miriam has been conducting some fascinating research in the JHC's archives over the past several months, some of which is uh, some of which research is woven into this presentation and two more programs this spring. And I know that you will enjoy learning from her. So without further ado, welcome Miriam Mora. Thank you, Rachel, and thanks. Uh... Ginevra and the uh, the JHC for the opportunity to give this first in three lectures and to serve as the first historian in residence at this organization. It's been a fantastic experience and I have had so much fun and such a productive time in the archives uh, and working with the NEHGS and JHC staffs. So this series of three lectures at uh, is meant to build on the previous two courses offered by the Weiner Center on Jewish history in America which have covered the populating of the United States up till the revolution and mass migration period uh, Jewish Boston. Over the course of these three lectures, I'm going to examine changes to the American Jewish landscape from the interwar period through the 1960s. Expanding in the topic of Jewish immigration in the US after the immigration restrictions of the 1920s presents an interesting question. Can we talk about immigration in a period of immigration restriction? Any immigration historian will tell you that the real meat of the story is not so much how many people came and when, but in how their presence affected their new home and how their new home affected them. For that reason, what we're really talking about in any conversation about migration is acculturation. A single but very important disclaimer before I begin, which is to say that with Jewish Americans, perhaps more than any other group, uh, one is constantly falling into the habit of referring to Jews in America as a unit. 
And this is not, has not been, and likely never will be an accurate thing to say. There is no single Jewish America. There has never been a unified voice that speaks for American Jews because we've never come really close to a consensus on anything very big. So no single central church leader or nation state dictating how to be Jewish means a constantly evolving, conflicting and often moving target. Honestly, that's what makes it so much fun to study. And in the case of today's lecture, we're looking at a generally underexamined period of Jewish American life sandwiched between the two highly examined events of mass migration and the Second World War, but in which so much changes for American Jews and generates a large amount of what we now think of as American Jewish tradition. The story of acculturation, or in this specific lecture, Jewish adaptation and altruism, begins where immigration leaves off. So I'm going to set the stage here with the drop off of Jewish mass migration to the U.S. From 1820 through 1924, there was an increasingly steady flow of Jews coming to America, culminating in a huge surge of immigrants at the turn of the 20th century. They were driven uh, by economic hardship, persecution, massive social and political upheavals of the 19th century, including industrialization, overpopulation, urbanization. Millions of Jews uh, from Europe left their homelands and came to the United States. At the start of this period, they came largely from Central Europe, and though they primarily landed in New York, they resettled all across America in major cities as well as small towns. During this period, there was an almost hundredfold increase in the Jewish population from the, uh, in the U.S., from 3,000 in 1820 to 300,000 in 1880, and then from 1880 to 1920, another tenfold to roughly 3,500,000. From 1881 to 1924, the migration also shifted from coming primarily from Central uh, Europe eastward, with more than two and a half million Eastern European Jews driven by persecution and a lack of economic opportunity. Most of those who arrived as part of this flood of immigrants settled in cities as working class, Yiddish speaking migrants with strong networks of cultural, spiritual, voluntary, social organizations. This period ended with the passage of restrictive laws in 1921 and 24. Without spending too much time on these restrictive immigration acts, I will at least briefly explain why the Johnson Reed Act of 1924 is so significant. The Act of 24 marked the greatest nativist triumph, triumph until this time, and it came as no great surprise to those who were living with the realities of American life after the Great War. The question wasn't so much if there would be massive restrictions in 24, but how massive those restrictions would be and who they would be likely to exclude and affect. I'm guessing that most of you uh, here with us watching are familiar with ideas of nativism and how prevalent it was at the turn of the century. So I'm not going to go into the key players and, and motivations of the nativist movement. Um, though if you haven't seen it before, this is a, a very famous uh, published cartoon of the time that kind of shows part of this nativist fear of, of Jews pouring in from being persecuted in Russia and flooding New York, which is relabeled here, New Jerusalem. And the, uh, the it says on the, on the left, our first families being driven out to the West. So it's talking about people, first families fleeing the city while all these Jewish migrants come in. Suffice it to say that fears about job stealing and lower standards of living combined with perceived attacks on Protestant American dominance led to such dramatic separatism that immigration historian John Hyam dubbed the decade the tribal 20s. The Johnson Reed Act established a quota system that expanded the restrictive laws that began in 1920 and based the numbers for quotas on the existing composition of the United States. Deciding that recent decades made the current composition of the US undesirable, the quota system established would be based not on the 1920 data, by which time one third of Americans were immigrants, but on the 1890 data, cutting eligible immigrants from 270,000 to 180,000, and then capping that at 150,000 150, a year. The effect on Jewish immigration was drastic. From 1904 to 1914, the average annual immigration was over 100,000. In 1921, just before the law went into operation, Jewish immigrants numbered just under 120,000. In 1922, after the first round of restrictions, it dropped to 53,524 and then even lower in the next two years following. By the time the 24 Act came out, the government didn't think that this drop in numbers was enough. So the Johnson Reed Act, so in the Johnson Reed Act, the quotas were changed from 3% of the existing of the population 
uh, in the determined date to 2%. This new formula cut Jewish immigration by more than 75%. So that in 1925, it was only 10,292, and it hovered around that figure until the late 30s. The reason I give this uh, a review of this dramatic drop in numbers is that it necessitated a rapid redefinition of Jewish America from a population of new immigrants to a population of permanent citizens acculturating as Americans. The Great Depression hit in 1929, and had it not, who knows how restriction would have evolved or loosened. But given the sudden halt of economic prosperity, restrictions and practices through the 30s were shaped by both the nativism of the 20s and the reaction to the Great Depression. In 1930, the Jewish American population was between 4.2 and 4.4 million. That's 3.4 to 3.5% of the total population and found their progress as an American immigrant community halted in many ways. At the same time, American Jewry became for the first time a predominantly native born rather than immigrant population with the first migrate, mass generation of American born Jews coming of age in a period of dramatic uncertainty and flux. <clears throat> Excuse me. They faced unprecedented economic hardships, barriers to children's acculturation and access to American institutions and rising anti-Semitism. Dismal job prospects, university quotas uh, and employment discrimination all rose up as barriers to Jewish success. Educated Jewish middle class young adults struggled to find work and working class families often struggled to survive, largely on the support that they could muster from family, community, government and philanthropic institutions. As Jews were disproportionately employed in white collar positions, they suffered less economic strife than many other groups when the Depression hit. There was plenty of Jewish unemployment, of course, and the banks failing meant that many Jews were left completely devoid of their savings, along with so many other Americans. And those who were in blue collar jobs like garment workers lost their jobs in tremendous numbers. And in addition, because Jews were young Jews were facing these quotas in school and employment discrimination in universities and medical schools and law schools, all of this limited their options for success even more. One of the most defining characteristics of the Jewish American community at this point was their long standing network of charity and benevolent institutions. When, the, when Jews first came to New Amsterdam in 1654, Peter, Peter, Governor Peter Stuyvesant in the West India Company admitted them on the condition that they would care for the poor in their own community. In what was later known as the Stuyvesant Promise, this colonial contract influenced the trajectory of American charity as over the following centuries, Jews in the United States grew their charitable actions and traditions from just being a requirement of American entry to a source of pride and a defining characteristic. The Lenzmannschaften, uh, hometown societies, had in many ways been the core, of, core source of support for the Jewish immigrant community, providing religious, social, and cultural activities, along with a range of relief services, financial assistance, and sick benefits. The Landsmannschaft was a mutual aid society connected to an immigrant community from the same town, city, or village in Central or Eastern Europe. Landsmannschaften included religious and socialist organizations, as well as American-style fraternal orders. They provided immigrants with formal and informal social networks, and members helped one another with the financial needs, such as medical care and, and burial plots. In 1938, a Federal Works Progress Administration project identified 2,468 Landsmannschaften in New York City alone. Though I have no similar numerical data for Boston, there is currently a project of the Landsmannschaften of Boston underway at the Jewish Genealogical Society of Greater Boston. So if anyone here today has documents or memories pertaining to any of those organizations, they're actively looking for contributions like that to get us similar statistics. But Jewish char charitable organizations really ran the gamut from these smaller Landsmannschaften to Jewish federations, which tended to be funded by more affluent and more established Jewish communities. Jews also opened some of the largest and indeed first tuberculosis sanatory in the late 19th century and continued through, de through the depression. And I highlight these uh, in the images too, because I find these medical aid organizations particularly in interesting as some of them are so clearly in-group charities and some are much more targeting the public good. But in the case of TB particularly, it's interesting to examine the Jewish sanatoriums and preventoriums because they're places where the sick and potentially sick would live for indefinite durations. And there were none besides these Jewish ones that catered to observant Jewish dietary and religious requirements. This was also the case for Jewish orphanages across the country, though primarily in major cities. 
The name orphanage is a bit misleading as during the depression, they generally house children who were not parentless, but whose parents couldn't afford to feed and care for them or who had lost one parent and were left at the orphanage by the other parent until such a time when they could afford to collect them, presumably uh, upon remarriage. Jewish communities opened countless settlement houses for Jewish immigrants to provide language classes, uh, lectures on cultural subjects and lessons in citizenship, as well as high hygiene courses, uh, child rearing instruction, and in some cases, things like free baths. And this was both charitable work and self-serving. As the image of destitute Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe felt to many acculturated Jews like a huge step backwards in American acceptance. Though there had hardly been a time in which Jewish charitable networks and organizations were more needed than during the Depression, they too were threatened by the Depression itself, which challenged the Jewish community's ability to financially maintain their charitable institutions from within. But even more significantly, Roosevelt's New Deal forced private charitable organizations to reinvent themselves under the condition of the welfare state. More than being concerned for the few Jews, and the number was small, who needed the assistance of their charitable organizations, the Jewish establishment was concerned that eliminating private Jewish charity as a fundamental institution of Jewish American life would erode group, group cohesion and tarnish the image of Jews in the United States. A vital part of that image was not only that Jews cared for their own, but that the Jewish philanthropic community cared for others in addition to themselves. Though public welfare in many ways corroded the Jewish private charity structure, many mutual aid and ethnic loan societies did survive the depression. Uh, by the late 30s, the depression strain on the Landsmannschaften, the coming of age of the second generation who were less participatory in their structure and clientele, and the growth of successful public welfare programs had left the Landsmannschaften in a weakened state. They lacked the resources, but maintained their base. And in 1935, Hundreds of these small groups came together to form the Council of Fraternal and Benevolent Organizations, a move which was clearly a sign of its time, attempting to better fit sectar sectarian philosophy into the new world of New Deal America. The number of Landsmannschaften continued to decline um, over the next two decades into the 1950s, though some of the more resilient societies do continue to exist to this day. And this is also an interesting moment in Jewish America in terms of the desire to become American at a time when the example of Jewish philanthropy was valued and treasured as a distinctively successful element of Jewish or ethnic organizations, they were given the opportunity to join with the rest of the nation, benefiting from the security of the New Deal alongside their fellow countrymen and women, and leaving behind elements of their distinctiveness on the American Jewish landscape. Debates about erosion of group cohesion and the value of assimilation were commonplace in conversations about the future of Jewish charity. And Jewish America responded to this moment the way that they routinely responded to crisis of community, self, and survival. They redefined Jewish life to more comfortably fit the rest of America. Accepting that new government programs eliminated the need for some longstanding Jewish institutions, they wove government services into their practices and lives, and by doing so, also wove themselves more cohesively into American society. Those who wanted to continue to do the good work of Jewish philanthropies in the areas that the government had begun to practice pivoted from Jewish practice to American practice, getting more involved in government welfare programs uh, and using that as a venue for their expertise and, and experience of passion. The organizations also had to redefine themselves to survive, to maintain and find new purpose in New Deal America. And their pivot was less from one agency to another and more from public welfare to ethnic identity. Jewish federations redefined themselves, no longer the support network for the relief of the Jewish population, but the centers of Jewish life, providing a Jewish space and helping to sustain Jewish identity in an ever acculturating Jewish American community. It's true of most ethnic communities in America that as elements of the lives of a specific immigrant group become supported by American society, that group doesn't become less themselves, though some individuals uh, stray further away, particularly those on the periphery of the group, but the center becomes more determinately themselves, filling in the spaces that American acceptance has left for group identity to be maintained more purposefully. This left American Jews with two primary forms of distinctively Jewish organizations, the Federation or cultural center, which was not generally affiliated with any particular sect of Jewish religious practice and the synagogue or spiritual center. At the same time that Jews were negotiating for their own place in America vis-a-vis -vis philanthropy, charity work, 
and the New Deal, they were also appearing in high places to an unprecedented degree. Scholars frequently reference the interwar period as the time when American Jews emerge as significant players on the, in American and world politics. Some firsts, for example, in the United States include, and these are first generation Jews, those born into that uh, mass migration, uh, first generation coming of age at this time, born to immigrant parents, the first Jewish Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis, whose parents came from Prague, the first female US representative, Florence Prague Kahn, whose parents came from Poland, and the first Jewish Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau Jr., whose parents came from Germany. There were also Jews visible in socialist movements at the time across Europe, as well as in the United States, and very active in labor movements around the global north, often connected to socialist movements. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later uh, when we're discussing anti-Semitism and the first Red Scare. So after the so-called golden doors had slammed shut in 1924, a wave of second generation American Jews worked harder than ever to acculturate into American society in the face of anti-immigrant sentiment and rising anti-Semitism. For the first time in 100 years, American Jewish culture was not sustained by a steady influx of new migrants and dominated by foreigners. Uh, see on the left here on the screen, a kind of stereotypical depiction of a Jewish socialist Eastern European greenhorn. As I mentioned earlier, native-born American Jews now outnumbering immigrants. And, and as such, they have the ability to redefine American culture and influence, and perhaps most noticeably, the way that they're seen by their fellow countrymen and women. So Jewish life refocused in many ways from the task of absorbing new immigrants to that of sustaining Jewish unity and identity while becoming as American and therefore accepted as possible. The generation that was coming of age when the depression hit were largely entering the middle class and were often seen or depicted by larger American society as they had been in Western uh, Europe as gauche new money or all right -nicks. The all right -nick, the nouveau riche, soon became a dominant Jewish presence in much of the view of, but uh, much of the view of Jews in America an established more acculturated Jewish American retaining a sense of Jewish religious and ethnic identity while Americanizing in many ways. I chose these images to show this drastic change and comparison of the, the kind of ghetto greenhorn Jewish immigrant on the left and the acculturated boy chick, the all right Nick, uh, who, though well dressed, was often portrayed negatively as vulgar, uh, someone whose economic success gave him undeserved power and standing in the United States. Though it's harder to find ideal images to demonstrate it, the female stereotypes on both sides um, are equally, if not more, unpleasant as the Allrightnik's wife was painted as the paradigm of conspicuous consumption and the female socialist mannish and brash. And these stereotypes of both the foreign Jew socialist uh, or anarchist free of the shackles of Europe to indulge in radicalism and the overindulged Allrightnik were both negative but frequent comments on the Americanization process. And as a historian of masculinity, I can't help but share with you one of my own favorite elements of this acculturation process that's a perfect intersection of acculturation and resistance. In my upcoming book, I argue that one of the most consistent methods of acculturation for Jews in America is the attempt to attain American masculinity, as manhood was and is considered so linked to our concept of nationhood. It is, however, a key theme in anti-Semitic stereotyping about Jews that they are uniquely unmanly, weak, intellectual, cowardly, oversexed, degenerate. These are largely their own words, which we can discuss later during the Q&A if anyone is interested. In early 20th century America, established Jewish New Yorkers, specifically the, the uptown Jews, were closer to shaking these negative assumptions about Jewish manhood than the new immigrants downtown, but they weren't quite there yet. They were still barred from athletic institutions, country clubs, fraternities, universities, and other American breeding grounds for masculinity and social acceptance. Their image was, in addition, always, they felt, tarnished by the downtown element, maintaining old world ways and behaviors and gender roles, language, religious practice, etc. One of the most interesting ways in which the uptown Jews attempted to resolve the issue of the downtown Jews to their own benefit was to masculinize them in the most American way they knew, following in early settler and pioneer footsteps and working the land. They themselves, of course, had no interest in leaving the Upper West Side uh, to work on farms in New Jersey or upstate, but they created a number of programs, and not just in New Jersey and New York, but in Connecticut, Louisiana, Texas, Michigan, Kansas, and elsewhere, and these included 
farm schools, agricultural settlement, settlements, uh, farming collectives to send poor young Jewish men and immigrants from the city to the country to become more American. And their goal was to counter the stereotype that Jewish men were unathletic, physically inferior, and suitable only for intellectual work. And here, more philanthropic institutions like the Baird de Hirsch Fund, the, Wolf, uh, the Woodbine School, and others led the Jewish story specifically targeting young Jewish immigrants, even more the children of uh, the children of immigrants, first generations, to train them for a life in agriculture, to help acculturate them, yes, but also to keep them uh, from resorting to petty thief or crime on the streets of the Lower East Side, as so many did. Though there were a few agricultural settlements that did last some time, on the whole, the experiment wasn't successful. Some transformed from farms to industry, um, most shut down completely. Even among the American Jews who did settle in the countryside or small, smaller rural towns, Jewish people did not unanimously agree that they were capable of a life of farming. In an early report on an attempt to relocate Jews from cities to more rustic areas, in this case specifically Warren, Pennsylvania, local Jewish leadership explained that Jews who relocated to small towns needed to be trained instead as artisans because Jews were simply ill-suited to farm life. Their assumptions reflected the beliefs of Jewish character on the previous slide, that Jewish men, they insisted, were too intent on profitable enterprise and Jewish women not content with the isolated life that agriculture provided. Of course, these claims assume a universality of Jewish tendencies that recalls precisely the anti-Semitic stereotypes that American Jews hoped to dispel through agricultural enterprise. The confident recitation of these Jewish stereotypes by Jews themselves uh, to explain the failures in this area of work points to the degree to which Jews had really internalized and believed these attributes to be truly Jewish ones. Though that doesn't mean that they were. The most successful enterprises in this movement were those that melded farming with industry or educated young Jews in agricultural science, as opposed to training them as farmers to relocate themselves and their families to the country. The relocation to the countryside never proved an effective method for the masses of first and second generation immigrants at this time. That doesn't mean that they weren't eager to relocate. One of the marks of success for any immigrant community is relocation to a more desirable and prosperous neighborhood. In Boston, there were the equivalent of New York's uptown and downtown Jews as the mass migration period Jewish immigrants settled in the North, South, and particularly West ends of central Boston with the upwardly mobile and middle and upper class Jews moving on to Upper Roxbury and Dorchester. In Chicago, it was the South Side uh, German Jews who were English speaking, established and comfortable and the West Side Jews who were so largely Yiddish speaking that the Chicago West Side came to be known as the Great Vest, highlighting the Yiddish accents of its inhabitants. And I put these pictures up on the screen so you can see the kind of similarities um, you know, people milling around on the streets and sitting on stoops in the in the top pictures, and then these kind of bigger, grander buildings, wider streets uh, in the more affluent neighborhoods. Many expected that relocating to wealthier neighborhoods with tree-lined streets, better educational opportunities, access to well-manicured public parks would also put them in greater proximity to their Protestant neighbors, and therefore greater opportunities for social interaction outside of the Jewish community, which is very helpful for acculturation. But this isn't what occurred, at least not quickly. Generally, when one ethnic group moved into a neighborhood, the previous residents tended to leave. So even within the city limits, neighborhood was a signifier of status. And as one group entered, previous residents decided that it was time to move on. The result of which being that at least for these Jewish families, they were economically upwardly mobile, but not socially upwardly mobile. Some of the most significant ways that the Jewish community acculturated and changed their image on the whole was in their religious practice. By the period under discussion, three sects of American Jewish practice, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, had been well established and helped to shape the American Jewish landscape. Synagogues of all sorts, but most dramatically in the Reform and Conservative movements, America Americanized in many ways, partially to accommodate the second generation who were resistant to immigrant culture, and partially to appear more like their Protestant neighbors and put them more at ease. Incorporating organs and choirs, for example, sent a message to the outside community. The sounds coming from within the synagogue were less alien, more church-like, they sounded familiar, like a legitimate American religion. Yiddish pulpit rabbis came to be replaced or paired with English-speaking ones, and Jewish life began to center on the children uh, in particularly American ways. <clears throat> 
Much like the philanthropies that I discussed, congregations began to promote themselves as centers of Jewish life, not only houses of worship. Integrating athletics, social programming, educational programming, this provided more opportunities to engage with the Jewish youth and keep them involved in the Jewish community and Jewish life. The evolution of the bar mitzvah from a simple ceremony, for example, to a lavish event showed an American consumerism which hadn't been present in previous generations and which progressed into the bat mitzvah as well once they began in the United States, the 100th anniversary of which occurred last year, actually. Childhood education on the whole really took off in 1930s Jewish America. Refocusing efforts of cultural cohesion and retention uh, of Jewish life on the new generation and instilling in them a very American set of Jewish values and practices. And none of this, of course, occurred in a vacuum. Larger American movements in progressive education, particularly the educational reforms emerging from John Dewey's theory of education, greatly influenced what would become the accepted best practices of Jewish schooling. During the period uh, right before our lecture cup is covering, Jewish education was inconsistent. It lacked um, you know, quality published educational curricula, textbooks. Only during this period did Jewish Americans begin to engage with the supplementary school model that many of us and our children have grown up with. There was a particular movement by a man named Samson, Samson Benderly that married Dewey's social theories of how education ought to look with cultural Zionism. And it's focused not on Jewish religion, but on Jewish peoplehood, which promoted the idea that the Jewish community was responsible for the religious education of their children as a whole outside of the secular school system. Benderly was himself an immigrant from pre-state Palestine with a religious upbringing, but he was not religious as an adult. Because of his cultural Zionism, however, he incorporated the teaching of modern conversational Hebrew into American Jewish education, promoting the concept of Jewish peoplehood homeland, and speakable language as opposed to biblical and Talmudic Hebrew taught in Eastern European immigrant yeshivas. He also stressed the idea that there should be formal education for Jewish educators, accreditation and consistency. And his was just one approach, um, and it targeted those who were in you know, actively Americanizing, not the Orthodox, not those attending yeshivas. And of course, even now, there's no universal model, but what we think of as Hebrew school was in, after school Hebrew school and weekend Hebrew school was in large part from Benderly and his movement. And it's one of the changes from this period that most directly influenced what we think of as American Judaism, which so heavily focuses on childhood education. During the period between the wars, the Jewish community became ever increasingly asso associated politically with the Democratic Party. The party's support for the social, the causes of social welfare and economic reform attracted many immigrants. And though a number of Jews participated in radical parties, more and more they embraced American liberalism. The election and presidency of FDR also served to connect American Jews more strongly to the party as his social programs appealed to those who were leaning both Democrat and socialist because of his goals to help the poor and working class. He also welcomed an unprecedented number of Jewish advisors into his inner circle. Many Jewish leaders believed that he would help to ease immigration restrictions and to save European Jews. And in that, as we now know, they were, they were mistaken. Uh, and there's going to be more on that in our next lecture uh, next month on the Second World War and American Jewry. In a recent interview, historian Beth Wanger recounted a Yiddish joke popular at the time, which really captures the incredible degree of Jewish support for FDR. So the joke is, and you have to know here that in German and Yiddish, Welt means world. The Yidden haben drei Welten. The Jews have three worlds. Die Welt, this world. Jene Welt, the world to come. Und Rose Welt. But this is also the period in which we see Jews disproportionately involved in labor movements, as well as socialist and communist parties and political actions. And it's in these years, directly preceding our class, that the first Red Scare in America occurred. And this served to tie Jews even more stro strongly to communism in the eyes of the American public, even if not in reality. In 1919, the Senate committee headed by Senator Overman began public hearings on the relation between, quote, German brewers and Bolshevik propaganda, unquote. And in these Senate hearings, the, quote, Jew Bolshevik, unquote, is repeatedly cited. There was even testimony under oath by a Dr. George S. Simmons that the Bolsheviks were Jews and that the conspiracy to overthrow the czar was hatched in New York's Lower East Side ghetto. The Jewish establishment, and here I mean the uptown Jews, 
the American Jewish Committee and leading Jewish figures like Louis Marshall were immediately decrying these accusations, publishing about how anti-Bolshevik American Jews really were, saying uh, to the New York Times, this is Louis Marshall, said, quote, attack Bolshevism as much as you please, and the Jews of America are with you, unquote. But as much as some Jews attempted to separate their image from that of the Bolsheviks, the repeating of terms like Bolshevist Jew and Jewish Boshis from prominent American politicians and political and cultural figures helped cement the connection in the minds of much of the general public. Though it's never possible or accurate to put all of something like this on one figure, there is one person I always mention when I'm talking about the first Red Scare and the link to American anti-Semitism, and that's Boris Brassel. Brassel was a lawyer for the Imperial Russian Ministry of Justice, where he prosecuted, notably, a blood libel case in 1912 of a Jewish factory where uh, superintendent, Menachem Bayliss, accused of ritual murder. He served in the Tsar's army during World War I and then came to America to work as a lawyer for an Anglo-Russian purchasing committee. And that's where he was when the October Revolution occurred, and he never went back. Though he supported the restoration of the Russian monarchy from afar and remained always very uh, ardently anti-communist. Prassel is responsible, at least according to many historians, for being the first to publish the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion in the United States. That he was anti-Semitic was and is not in question. He didn't attempt to hide it. He wrote very proudly to one of his friends about his most recent publications, quote, Within the last year, I have written three books, two of which have done the Jews more injury than would have been done to them by 10 pogroms, unquote. We don't have too much time left to discuss anti-Semitism, though using Brassel as a jumping off point, I want to point not so much to the t statistics and large anti-Semitic events of the 1930s, and there was a huge rise in anti-Semitic groups, especially during this time, but to the ways in which mass media really helped to disseminate anti-Semitic ideas far beyond the protocols and into the daily lives of American citizens. Russell's influence, to that point, may have remained limited had his work not been picked up and entirely believed by industrialist Henry Ford. Henry Ford was as influential as nearly Amer any American in his time, and he was fiercely anti-Semitic. He also did not attempt to hide it. He republished the protocols, which he had read from Brassel as factual artifacts in his newspaper, The Dearborn Independent, which, he, which was read as news in millions of American homes between 1920 and 1927. He also wrote and published a regular piece in the paper, later compiled and printed in bound editions, which you can see some of here, uh, called The International Jew. It ran in 91 consecutive issues. I need not speak, I should hope, to its validity or its readability. By 1923, it was common knowledge and even printed in the New York Times that Ford was himself financing Hitler, who praised the international Jew in his own publication, Mein Kampf. Ironically, by 1920, Ford was even calling Louis Marshall, who you may remember was so ardently anti-Bolshevik, calling Louis Marshall a Bolshevik orator in his own newspaper. Ford himself is a fascinating character for so many reasons, from his relationship to Hitler, to his genuinely amazing and valuable contributions to American society, to his abusive rubber plantation in his own mini country, Fordlandia in the Amazon jungle, uh, to his determination to eradicate the cow from the face of the earth and therefore invent some very early and supposedly disgusting meat alternatives. Very, very interesting guy. But his legacy in our story today is as a conduit for anti-Semitism, founded in the fear of communism and contributing hugely to a spike in discrimination against Jews in housing, employment, social contracts, and admissions to colleges, which some of which I've mentioned. His rhetoric about the irredeemable Jewish people is particularly interesting because Henry Ford was a huge believer in the advocate of the, and advocate of the American power of assimilation to improve upon the condition of, of most any immigrant and to transform them into worthy Americans. Uh, the picture you see on the upper right is from the uh, Henry Ford English School, which was established in 1914 through the Ford Motor Company, where diverse immigrant employees would learn the English language and take civ civics lessons in preparation for becoming citizens and shed the undesirable qualities of their home countries. At the graduation ceremony, which is what this is a picture of here, um, you can see students wearing clothes from their native countries, 
descending from uh, carrying luggage, descending from a ship, an immigrant ship from a plank uh, into an enormous American melting pot where teachers would stir the pot with long paddles and out of it would emerge the same people, but dressed in homogenous suits and wearing American flags, having shed all of their undesirable immigrant uh, characteristics. And though, of course, Henry Ford was only one man, and here there are many co contributors to increasing American anti-Semitism, Ford was so powerful and respected that his anti-Jewish rhetoric and publications were uniquely influential. And American Jews were justifiably put on edge by his publications and his activities with fascists in Europe. Here you can see in the picture on the left, um, this the truth about Henry Ford, which is uh, published here in Yiddish, as uh, you can see behind him in the shadow of him is a Klansman. Other popular figures of the time, including Father Charles Coughlin, also known as the radio priest, the fighting priest, and the angel of the airways. Coughlin broadcast weekly from radio station in Royal Oak, Michigan from 1926 to 1940 and reached 15 million listeners a week. I know I'm showing my uh, Michigan roots here. I'm from Michigan, <laughs> focusing on, on my local anti-Semites. But they did have national influence. Um, of course, there are others all over the country who are also anti-Semitic and putting this rhetoric into the world. But the regional location of these two really does matter because the Detroit metro area remained home to the largest neo-Nazi population in the country uh, well into the 2000s. And perhaps still, though, I haven't checked the current data with the ADL for some time. But through print media and radio, these men spread their anti-Semitic rhetoric through the 20s and 30s very aggressively. And by the mid 30s, not only had fascist movements emerged across Europe, they echoed into the social and political fabric of the United States. There were pro-Nazi rallies, anti-Semitic groups, an increase in physical attacks on American Jews, and the resurgence of other racist organizations and leaders in the US, just as there were in Latin America, Europe, and the Middle East. As you can imagine, this rising anti-Semitism also forced Jewish Americans to change the way they framed and participated in American life, as had the earlier factors we discussed. Certainly, Jewish leaders spoke out against key figures propagating such ideas. The negative press that his overt anti-Semitism brought him from Hollywood elites to President Wilson led to a public apology uh, by Henry Ford in 1927 to Louis Marshall, the president at the time of the American Jewish Committee. Uh, if we could advance to the next slide. He wrote to Marshall, quote, I deem it to be my duty as an honorable man to make amends for the wrong done to the Jews as fellow men and brothers, by asking their forgiveness for the harm that I have unintentionally committed by retracting so far as lies, uh, as lies within my power the offensive charges laid at their door by these publications, and by giving them the unqualified assurance that henceforth they may look to me for friendship and goodwill. In Marshall's public acceptance of this apology, he wrote that as far as he could influence the Jewish forgiveness of Henry Ford, he would, because, quote, there flows in my veins the blood of ancestors who were inured to suffering and nevertheless remained steadfast in their trust in God. He added, essentially, the spirit of forgiveness is a Jewish trait, end quote. Not all Jews, however, were so quick to forgive Henry Ford. He routinely sent, for example, a free car of each new model to the rabbi of one of the larger Detroit area synagogues who always sent it back untouched with a note saying return to sender, indicating his refusal, refusal to forgive or forget. Of course, there were anti-Nazi movements, uh, protests for Jewish protection and outspoken leaders from the Jewish world against anti-Semitism in the United States. Overall, however, one of the most dramatic responses to this rising anti-Semitism in America from within the Jewish community was an increasing support for the Zionist movement, which until the 1930s didn't have a huge support network among American Jews, and then even more so after the Holocaust. In fact, many prominent Jewish leaders in America were ardently anti-Zionist at this time, convinced that Jews had found their home in the United States and that advocating for a Jewish state would negate their hard-earned acceptance in America and cripple their efforts to integrate more fully. So we don't have time to cover all of this. This topic will be covered in our next two lectures on Jews in World War II and the Jewish-American relationship to the newly formed state of Israel. But adding this newer element of, of physical danger to the already discuss, discussed conditions of economic hardship, uh, generational coming of age, and nativism, it's no surprise that Jews during these years attempted even more to unite in spite of their dis differences and stress their interdependence within the Jewish community. 
leaving regional old world identities in favor of American Jewish communal organizations, they began to coalesce into an intentionally unified American Jewish community, a community that would try, as I'll cover in my next lecture, to stand against the rising tides of anti-Semitism, to stress its American allegiance during a time of war, and to survive as a community during a far away war, specifically against the Jewish people. And I think I, I may have run a couple of minutes over, so I apologize for that, but thank you for your patience with me and my attempts to cover so much ground in one sitting. I'll hand you back to Rachel King before we get to your questions, which I look forward to. Rachel? Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, that was so interesting and, and covered so much ground. Um, there's a lot to uh, unpack there. Um, before we get to questions, I did just want to, as Miriam just mentioned, um, she has two, um, two more explorations of American Jewish life uh, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, on uh, Tuesday, April 25th, she'll be speaking about um, Jewish Americans, anti-Semitism, and the Second World War, as she just mentioned. And on Thursday, May 18th, she will be exploring the, um, the context of the creation of um, Israel and its impact on American Jewish identity and life. Um, so interesting to go back to that point in history, uh, obviously, as um, you know, as the world today is wrestling with um, um, the state of Israel. Um, so uh, I, we hope you'll join us again and um, please mark your calendars. So let's turn to some questions. Um, Miriam, I hoped that first um, you could articulate for us how you see the difference between acculturation and assimilation. Can you articulate that uh, for us? That's a really good question, thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. On the whole, immigration historians don't use the term assimilation as much because it assumes a um, loss, you know, a loss of, of the culture that that immigrant communities bring in to be replaced by an American homogeneity. Um, so acculturation is preferred because it, it implies change, but also preservation of culture. Um, and it, it's tough when you're getting into this specific period because of course assimilation is the term that they used at that time. So when you're reading the original sources, um, you know, a lot of what I read in, in the, uh, the archive at the Jewish Heritage Center does talk about assimilation as a really positive thing. And that's mm -hmm. certainly the language that anti-Semites were using at the time too, um, like Henry Ford, talking about Jews' inability to assimilate. But acculturation mm -hmm. is, is the term I prefer. Um, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for explaining that. Um, and you really presented that sort of um, push and pull between becoming American, shedding some of the immigrant um, you know, characteristics and also hanging on to Jewish identity and, and sort of further um, defining American Jewish identity. Um, so we have um, some questions from the audience. And just as a reminder to everyone, you can type in your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, we have a question about, um, well, let's, let's just pick up, you were just um, sharing Henry Ford's um, apology, and um, someone is asking, when uh, was that apology, and what was the occasion for it? Yeah, uh, so, oh, am I still muted? No, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, it was in 1927, uh, which is why the close of his um publication of the International Jew in the Dearborn Independent really ran through 1927 and then halted. Um, it was written in reaction to charges, legal charges brought against Henry Ford by, I think it's, I think his name was Aaron Shapiro, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, uh, he, he was, he filed suit against Ford for defamation because of the Dearborn Independent. And this brought Henry Ford really kind of around to the notion that this was maybe not, that some of what he published wasn't real or wasn't accurate supposedly it's a, it was a really tense uh, apology and acceptance because one of the the key points of the apology and I didn't read the entire thing obviously I excerpted excerpt 
reflected part of it on screen and then read an even smaller part of that. But the biggest part of his apology was that he promised the American Jewish community that he would stop publishing these articles and that he would retract them to the best of his ability and do everything he could to stop them from circulating. And that did not happen. So, you know, I think arguably he did it to put people at ease who were worried, who were beginning to sever ties with him publicly. There was a lot, he was getting a lot of heat from Hollywood celebrities and um, and the Jewish legal profession. Um, but I don't personally uh, did not find it very convincing, you know, and even if I had, I think his following actions kind of spoke for themselves. He didn't publish those things anymore. Um, he did continue to do plenty of other crazy things, but uh, but he they continued to circulate those publications that uh, the copies that I pulled up. I think the bound editions in that slide were not uh, were not were published you know, as later mm -hmm. compilations of the, of the international Jew. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Dassey asks, and I believe this goes back to the slide um, about the farms. That was a fascinating story about the uptown and downtown Jews and the uptown Jews um, trying to turn their newer, um, um, you know, brethren into cowboys, basically, it sounds like. Um, so Dasi asks, can you speak more about Warren, Pennsylvania? Um, was that where, that was where one of the farms was, I believe? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it's tough for me to remember. I don't want to misrepresent it. Um, I believe though that, I, I mean, I know that the, the kind of, I didn't, I didn't quote it, but the, the, people who I paraphrased who had attempted to live in Warren. Um, it was published in an agricultural magazine at the time, I think it was called The Old Ulster. Um, and it was it, it was analyzing uh, why these Jewish communities, why this Jewish agricultural community had failed. And yeah. it, 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 it existed for, I think, definitely over a decade, but, Pretty much what they were saying, at least in Warren, I can't give you any specifics without, you know, digging up the sources and, and refreshing my memory. Um, but what they were saying was that people had moved out there and they had started to farm and they had learned and they had tried, but they all ended up kind of migrating back into business. You know, that people started producing home goods instead of just relying on farm. And that also got them more out into the community. And this was the assumption about Jewish women was that they were incapable of living this solitary non-social life. And it's hard to say whether that's accurate or part of this kind of internalized anti-Semitic gendered archetypes that people that were so prevalent at the time that Jewish women were, you know, incredibly outgoing and and social and needed to be like in the midst of everything. Um, you know, I think it's much more likely personally, uh, after reading the sources, I think it's much more likely that uh, they came from cities and tight-knit Jewish communities. Um, even if they weren't from cities, they were coming from shtetls in Eastern Europe, and then they got sent out into the middle of nowhere to live on a farm. I mean, not that Warren, Pennsylvania is truly the middle of nowhere, but, you know, at this time, it was. It was an agricultural community, and that was not something that they were used to. So, uh, but if this, if this person who asked about it wants me to send them specific sources, feel free to email me, and I and I can dig those back up and and give you pointers to that, that information. Um. Oh, uh, here's an interesting follow-up question. Um, could you comment on um, the failure of Jews as farmers in America, but their success in Israel? I can. Uh, yeah, certainly. Some of it, I mean, some of this is, uh, you know, a, a little bit of conjecture, but one of the big differences is in how they got there. Um, you know, the farming collectives, the kibbutzim across Israel, um, you know, the kind of original Halutzim who were there tilling the land, they were part of a largely socialist movement, people who migrated there for this purpose. Whereas a lot of the Jewish agriculturalists that I'm talking about in America were kind of, you know, they came to the U.S. out of desperation or, you know, to, to escape persecution or for more economic opportunity, maybe not from such a horrible situation, but uh, but for very different reasons. And then they found city life very difficult and overpopulated and dangerous and got kind of ushered into this life that they had not intended. Mm -hmm. 
and that's I think you know one of the main reasons is that they weren't invested in it. Uh, whereas you know the the kind of hope for making the desert bloom and you know creating the Jewish homeland in Palestine that is a very motiva- motivating factor uh, in you know perseverance and and the ability to build and work the land in a different way. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, we have a question. Can you say something about the YMHA in Jewish life at, during this period? And you had, you had mentioned the, um, you know, the federations as sort of a communal center. Um, here's a different kind of communal, communal center. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the YMHA and YWHA, um, both organizations I've done, you know, much research about in this period, in the context, I can speak to it in the context of Jewish gender, primarily. Um, they, there were, I would say, when it comes to the, are we, t- sorry, was the question specifically about agri- agricultural? No, agricultural? this was it, about the YMHA in Jewish life at this time. Uh, oh, sure, well, there's, there's, a, there's a Hebrew association, yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a very parallel kind of movement going on um, in the YMHA, which is not about agriculture, but is about Americanizing young young Jewish boys from the city it, through nature. So there's a few kind of key f- figures in this, um, or all around the country. Some based out of Cincinnati, I think, where Hebrew Union College was, and you know, uh, but everywhere to to bring Jewish boys out to summer camp to make men of them. Um, and there's a lot of that that's happening through the through the uh, the YMHA. So, for example, um, I found I have like a a collection of of Jewish summer camp boys summer camp pamphlets that say, you know, bring your city boy out, and we will build up his weakened condition and turn him into an American man. You know, there's a lot of almost all of them had names like Camp Kowaga or you know these kind of Native American made up words. Uh, I mean you know, to sound like like Native American language to kind of, you know, put one in mind of these strong uh, indigenous peoples and saying, we will take your city boy and we will turn him into this more manly, um, healthy American figure. And this is specifically targeting the children of immigrants um, in the inner city where people are, you know, where they're overpopulated and they have less access to nature and, you know, all that. Um, but also, the, I mentioned athletics. Um, that's absolutely happening in the YMHAs and the YWHAs, the women's associations as well. You know, they they put on play both uh, men's and women's put on plays and hold community events. But they also, you know, support athletic groups around the city or even have their own teams and uh, and competitions and things like that. So it's all so, part of uh, one more comment on that, just because it is very interesting. Um, one of the reasons that they existed uh, along with entirely athletic institutions like the City Athletic Club or the Brooklyn, um, what was it called? The Jewish Jewish Athletic Club of Brooklyn. And sorry, I have done most of my research in New York. Um, But the reason that they existed was that Jews were barred entry to other athletic associations. So they created these parallel associations which sometimes stressed their Jewishness like the Jewish Athletic Club of Brooklyn, and sometimes absolutely never mentioned their Jewishness, like the City Athletic Club, where they tried to just present as kind of as Protestant as they could, um, so that they could prove that there was nothing unmanly about Jews in sports, that they were just like everybody else. Excellent. Well, I said one more question, but one question has come in. Um, I don't know if you can do the, uh, you know, the 60 second response, but um, but it is very interesting whether in this period, and you mentioned that during this interwar period, Jews were becoming or identifying with the progressive political movement in, in the United States. There was um, connection with socialism. Um, so we have a question about at what point did Jews become active in the formation of American labor unions? Was it during this period? And I'm sure there's a whole conversation about that. But. The short answer is it is before this period. It was before during the mass migration period, which is before what we've talked about. So in my very first slide, kind of at the beginning, I talked about this, the period from 1880 to 1920, where that that huge, yeah. tremendous explosion of immigrants, that's when uh, it really started, you know, in, in the 1880s I, um, is when they get really active uh, in the American, American labor movement. Excellent. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much, Miriam. And we look forward to learning from you again um, in April and May. Um, and I want to thank you and to our audience today for um, joining this terrific talk. Um, for those of you in the audience, as you leave um, this uh, webinar, we hope that you'll take just a quick minute to fill out a survey um, that helps us um, uh, gives us valuable feedback for future programming. Um, and I do invite you to learn more about the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center on our website, jewishheritagecenter.org. And I want to mention that this free program was made possible by contributions to the Jewish Heritage Center and to New England Historic Genealogical Society from people all over the world. Uh, we ask you to please consider making a donation of your own to support our educational and archival work. And you can do that at jewishheritagecenter.org slash donate. Thank you. Uh, we hope you'll join us again, as I said. And um, until then, uh, be well and uh, goodbye until next time. <laughs>